Panthalmintics are the compounds uh, which are used to kill the worms and their immature stages. Once the anthelmintic is administered in the body of the infected animals, what happens? What is the fate? How the anthelmintics enter into the body of the worm first? You know, there are only two ways. One is by ingestion. That is possible with nematodes and flukes. And the other is absorption through cuticle. That mainly happens in tapeworms. There are a number of groups, number of, uh, in each group, there are a number of compounds. But if you try to analyze the mode of action or mechanism of action of these anthelmintics, you will realize that these anthelmintics, you know, they adversely impact one of the two important processes for the worms to survive in the body of the infected animal. There are two vital processes for worms to survive in the body. One is the energy metabolism. They have to derive energy on a day-to-day -day basis for their day-to-day -day activities. And number two, in order to maintain the advantageous position in the body, as I have said, 80 to 90% are present in the gastrointestinal tract where a continuous peristaltic movements are going on. So in order to hold on to the mucosa and maintain the advantageous uh, place, they need a proper neuromuscular coordination. Even for a blood sucking activity, they require, hemonchus require a proper neuromuscular coordination. So you will find that these anthelmintics are either acting on energy metabolism of the worms or acting on neuromuscular transmission. Let us see one by one. Now, as far as the energy metabolism are concerned, there are three different pathways. But before that, you know, one has to understand that in mammals or in the host, the energy pathway is an aerobic pathway, while in the worms, it is anaerobic pathway that is without oxygen. And there are a number of biochemical reactions that are taking place, ultimately leading to release of uh, energy bonds or energy out of which the one reaction is very important as far as the anthelmintic activity is concerned. And that is called as a mitochondrial reaction in which the fumarate is converted to succinate by an enzyme called as fumarate reductase. And then succinate is converted into ATP bonds or an energy bond. And that is how the energy is synthesized. Now, there are certain anthelmintics, particularly belonging to benzamidazole group, where for example, fenbendazole, albendazole, they inhibit this particular enzyme fumarate reductase. So when the fumarate reductase enzyme is inhibited, fumarate cannot be converted into succinate and the energy cannot be produced. And that is how energy disruption is caused by the anthelmintic, like albendazole and fenbendazole. And that is how the energy synthesis stops. In addition to that, there is one more mechanism and that is uh, in case of mebendazole and to some extent also in case of albendazole and fenbendazole, that uh, a tubulin is a biochemical which is present in the intestinal cells of the nematodes. And this tubulin is very, very essential for the maintenance of microtubules in the intestinal cells. What is the function of microtubules? The microtubules are involved in the transportation of the glucose and other nutrients. So uptake of glucose and other nutrients is actually uh, assisted by these microtubules. And in order to have these microtubules in the intestinal cells, tubulin is required. Now compounds like mebendazole, flubendazole interacts with tubulin. So the tubulin is not available. When tubulin is not available, then the microtubules disappear. And when microtubules disappear, then there is no energy production. It leads to starvation, energy depletion, and death of the worm. So in the previous plate, we have seen fumarate reductase enzyme, which is inhibited by certain compounds from benzimidazole group. On this plate, we have seen that the tubulin, this is particular to nematodes. The tubulin is uh, bounded by the compounds and microtubules disappear. So the uptake of glucose and nutrients is inhibited. And that is how energy is depleted and there is a death of the worm. Let us see the chronology of the event. What is happening? You are administering the drug to the infected host. Then drug is taken by the worms. You wouldn't know the quantity of the drug taken by the worms. 
And as a result of which we have seen fumarate reductase system or a tubulin system, there is a cessation, stoppage of energy production. Does that mean that the worms are going to die instantaneously? No. The worms don't die immediately. They exist, particularly the roundworms. They exist on the reserve energy bond and the reserve energy is utilized during that particular phase. When the reserve energy is also utilized, then there is actual starvation, actual energy depletion, and then there is a death. There is one more way by which the energy metabolism can be disrupted, particularly in the flux, and that is by inhibiting oxidative phosphorylation of the carbohydrate. Because in flux, the energy is synthesized by the oxidative phosphorylation of carbohydrates, and that is how the energy is uh, synthesized. During this oxidative phosphorylation, there is a, a electron transport and certain anthelmintics like rafoxanide, oxyclozanide, or even substituted phenols, uh, they inhibit the electron transport and uh, oxidative phosphorylation. And that is how the energy is depleted. Why there are no reserved energy bonds in case of flux? There are some indirect references that those uh, energy bonds are not there. And that is why, you know, in this case, there is no uh, recommendation of a divided dose therapy or the other manipulation. It is to be given single dose. Then chlorosulon is one more compound which affects the energy metabolism. It inhibits certain enzymes of the glycolytic pathways in the body of the flux. And that is how it acts. Chlorosulon is also now flucicide available. So this is just a summary of what we have discussed. Benzimidazole. There is an inhibition of fumarate reductase and glucose transfer. The end result is starvation. Probenzimidazole, end result is starvation. Salicylanilides like rafoxanide, oxyclozanide, they are uncouplers of oxidative phosphorylation, but the end result is starvation and death. Substituted phenol, again, the end result is starvation and death. So that is how these are the three ways by which the energy metabolism can be disrupted. Then coming to the anthelmintics, which are acting on neuromuscular coordination. Now we will see where we can adversely impact this uh, mechanism. There are three ways. Number one, the compounds like levamisole, they act as a ganglionic stimulants. And as a result of this, there is a continuous travel of, you know, impulse, because impulse is continuously generated because of the ganglionic stimulation by levamisole and impulse travels to the synapse. There is a continuous secretion of acetylcholine and the muscular activity goes on indefinitely or continuously. And it goes on continuously. That results into spasms or a spastic paralysis. And that is how these worms lose their grip and they are eliminated from the host. So ganglionic stimulation is the one way of affecting neuromuscular transmission. The second way, is by pyrantel, which act as a cholinergic agonist. Chemically, this is somewhat similar to acetylcholine. So it continuously cause, stimulates the cholinergic receptors on the muscle, as it would be by acetylcholine after reaching the impulse. But here it is directly stimulating the uh, cholinergic receptors. So the muscular activity takes place indefinitely. There is no question of release of acetylcholine stress because acetylcholine is not released. And because of muscular activity continuously, there are spasms, spasms, and spasms resulting into spastic paralysis. And the worms lose their advantageous position and eliminate it from the host. The third way is by organophosphorus compounds, which are no more in use as an anthelmintic. So there are three spots where these anthelmintics act. One as a ganglionic stimulant, that is levamisole. Second, cholinergic agonist like pyrantel. And then acetylcholine is phase inhibitors like organophosphorus compound. So this is all stimulatory neurotransmission. Let us talk about inhibitory neurotransmission. There are two ways by which the neurotransmission can be affected at this site. One is like ivermectin, which potentiate the GABA, which is released at the synapse, and there is a prolonged hyperpolarization of the muscles, and as a result of which, the muscles become relaxed, and there is a flaccid paralysis. Compound like piprazine, these are nothing but the hyperpolarizing agents. 
so there is a hyperpolarization of the muscles and the muscles become relaxed so there is a flaccid paralysis but the end result is same the worms lose their grip and then eventually they are eliminated from the body so these are the five different mechanisms for the for adverse impact on the neuromuscular system of the worms or for causing neuromuscular incoordination in the worm this is the summary again that neuromuscular piprazin is a hyperpolarizing agent resulting into flaccid paralysis ivermectin or overmectins they cause potentiation of gaba so there is a flaccid paralysis and other three they are responsible for spastic paralysis because they affect the excitatory neurotransmission 